So it mine always was, by like a second or something. Mine was a second. It's wow. Funny. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Hello. Oh. How is everyone? Oh. Uh, welcome <laughs> to our final. So here's the thing. This is it. Well, of the decade. decade. Of the. Uh, oh. It's the final one of the decade. I realized that. Well, today. that's cool. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Um, so, it's actually our first official. Here's first the official, thing. Here's the it's thing. the first. It's the first and last of many. I think the first and last first and last. Well, it's the first and last. So it's the first. Here's the thing. And but it's, it's the, the last, last of first the, one. It's the last of the decade. <laughs> it's, it's the, the last, last of the year. It's the last of the year. So it's a first it's, last. And it's the last first one. And many <laughs> the last first one in many more to come. Welcome. Welcome Hi. to the conundrum that is us. I, I, I promise you we have not already delved into the the beer that's true. um it's just been it's been an, if for those of you who watch these you'll remember the last one which was near the end of october is just before halloween yeah uh we sat here and said in these very spots i feel like we've had a busier december yeah. and and i think we just set ourselves up for something as soon as that happened yeah. because uh i know for me personally and from what i've seen for you as well mm. Things just snowballed and got busy. It, from October, yeah, there was a big snowball. There yeah. was a big snowball. It was great. I mean, it's locked us. We're a little bit behind getting caught up for the end of the year, like like people do in business. Yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, I would say, um, I would say that things got like um, consulty, very consulty quickly for me at the end of the year. Like okay. not so much like transactions and things, more like calls and. Like, you know, uh, what about this option? What about that option? Next year looks like it's the year. Like, so that kind of thing really started happening for me. Um, I would say in the last, in the last month, but it happened hard and fast. So um, it's been busy. Like, like we just went from transactions, 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 consulting. So, 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 so. It was wow. hard to switch gears. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I want, I want a nap. <laughs> I feel like I could take one too, but uh, not yet. No. Uh, let's take care of some housekeeping. First off, the oh, we didn't alcohol. Introduce ourselves, right? yes. Oh, I, yeah, I guess we should do that. For those of you that don't <laughs> ever watch this, and this is maybe your first time, it's also your first, first, and last. That's right. Yeah. Last, first time. <laughs> uh, I am Jamie Vasey, Mortgage Jedi, the mortgage broker here in Guelph, Waterloo, Kitchener, Cambridge, and all over Ontario. Yep. Um, I'm Sandy Hare with the Hare Real Estate Collective at Remax Real Estate Center in Guelph, I also, in Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Hamilton. Everywhere. I, I will drive an hour out of my way to help serve people. There we go. Uh, let's talk about the beers. Normally, if again, we try to go local. Uh, wow. However, uh, Good things well, happen. Yes. So I. Before coming here, I went and, and took the opportunity to have dinner with a friend in Guelph, uh, and we went for sushi. Well, so I felt, about eating. So I felt like I um, I needed a dessert beer. So I got a, a pecan pie porter. Um, this is from Double Trouble, um, who Double Trouble is a, actually satellite brews out of Wellington. Okay. So um, that's where you will find them. Uh, well, you won't find them, but that's where they make their product. Um, and so I'm excited to try this. Um, I Are you done there? I didn't want to interrupt. No, there? I'm done with what it's like. I, I originally went to the beer store and thought, well, let's get something festive. And Big Rock Brewery um, had this guy here. And I was just at their brewery the other day for dinner. And it was like, I want to go to dinner with you there. Yes, yeah. like that's where I want to go for dinner. It has all of my favorites. It's got scotch eggs. Yeah, they've got barbecue. They've got all of it. That's they've nice. got all the things that Sandy likes: crab cakes, things like that. Mostly fried foods. Amazing. Um, but I saw this and I thought, oh, that's super festive and you know, big red holiday beers. It's even got a two from. Like if you got a sharpie, you can yeah. sit there and gift it to someone super that's got cool. a tag attached. And I was gonna have that. And also, I do like. Here's a little fun fact about me. I like warm things, warm beverages. This is warm. And I thought, oh, that's nice. A little warm beer, nice, full of flavor. And then my friend Jamie shows so, up and he knows me. I, this So many are. wonderful concerts that you've been to recently. Oh. And I saw that and I'm like, I have to get that. I just recently saw Bruce Dickinson on his book tour. Yes. So, man, the legend, Bruce Dickinson, super cool. And I went with my man friend Ken, and we went and saw him live. And this is Trooper. It's Iron Maiden's beer. I'm Should pumped. we get a Laura Brink company to do a man friend IPA? 
Oh, man. <laughs> Jamie, I'm telling you, we should get a man friend. We'll make it a double. Um, so I'm going to try this out. I haven't tried Trooper. I mean, it's a 4.7. It's a soda pop. It's, it's uh, yeah, I saw that, and I immediately thought, I have to get that for Sandy because that's that's I've, right up your alley. I have wanted to try Trooper, and when we were at uh, seeing Bruce Dickinson talk about his life and stuff, he actually had a Trooper beer there. Did he? he? Yeah. He that's was, fantastic. Yeah, so he was like, and I was like, oh, man, I still haven't tried it. So I'm like, I'm pumped. Just got Eddie on it. Full metal realtor. That's my new hat. That's my new hashtag. Full metal realtor. Full metal. Full metal realtor. That's my new hashtag. That's awesome. Because I am. You can just check out my Instagram. <laughs> Very much Super so. Um, all right. So a lot has happened in the last. I guess it's been almost a month and a half since we've done one of these now. It's been a yeah. Well, it's been a hot minute. We've been it's, busy. So it has been. I mean. The, you, come through the other side of all the festive activities happening with right especially for you you had uh you had your own soiree you had yep. a remax one you had a, a guelph what guelph guelph district, district area realtors, realtors. gdar gdar yep. um and uh, yes yeah, so there were so many that you were you were it's holiday it's online. holiday uh, i have one tomorrow party up yeah we have i think we have something every weekend I think we have something every weekend until basic, and then right up until Christmas, we have friends coming into town. Yeah, so so it has so it's been a while since we've been able to to, to do one of these, and a lot has happened in that time. Yeah, uh, Ooh, yeah. I have some questions. I and I attended the Mortgage Professionals Canada's national conference. Yeah, it looked boring. Yeah, didn't. <laughs> It was fantastic. I don't, I don't want to like bring back the '90s here, but not like it was looked. It's it looked was pretty super amazing. Cool. Uh, super cool. So a lot of great speakers, mm -hmm. a lot of great sessions. Uh, I'll talk about some of the information that I, I took away from that because very, um, very impactful insights. Um, but on top of that, they did this nice little. They called it the night circus, which okay. they had like they had like these. Carney type performers mm -hmm. performing and music. It really did look like if Tim Burton had directed Moulin Rouge. Like it was just, there was quite literally, uh, the food was on a table with a woman in the middle of the table walking around and like the table was on wheels. So she's walking around and the food is going with her. And I'm like, I just want to, I don't know if I can appropriately grab food yeah, off right? this table. Like, Excuse me. Excuse me, like, ma'am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab this uh, right scallop. Right here. Scallop like, to it was them. just, uh, but it was a good, excellent, excellent function. But more than anything else, um, it was just so good to hear some of the speakers who were there. Um, mm -hmm. One of the speakers is Benjamin Tall, who is uh, a chief economist for CIBC. And he is probably one of the most brilliant economic minds when it comes to um, all of the stuff that you hear in the media mm -hmm. related to, to is there a housing bubble, all of that stuff, and the mortgage industry, things like that, real estate mortgage industry. And he has this way of just cutting through and saying, this is the reality. Mm -hmm. You know, don't necessarily look at – here's why numbers are skewed, things like that. And it was, it was really, really good. So I'm going to – quickly do a quick synopsis of what he had to say. One, uh, we are not at all in a housing bubble. And the reason the, the reason that points to that is um, most cases when they determine that it's based on how many housing starts, so how many new, new buildings, new houses are being built versus how many households are there. And a household is determined by um, StatsCan, right? So when they do a, a census, mm -hmm. such as at this previous election, they determine how many house, households there are. But the thing is, when they determine a household, they don't count anyone who is a non-permanent resident. Mm -hmm. So anyone who hasn't got, so any immigrants who haven't gotten residency status yet, mm -hmm. they don't count any students who indicate they're going to be moving back home with their parents after they graduate. Okay. They don't count. So there's huge groups, huge pockets of people who aren't counted as households, yet they're living somewhere and renting there, and somebody has to own that property that they live and rent in. So it looks like the housing starts are outpacing the number of households we have, but in reality, if you take into account all those people who are renting that fall into those scenarios, the housing starts are actually lower than the amount of households we have. And so all of these people in New York and Chicago and places like this are short-selling the Canadian a uh, the Canadian real estate market, they think that there's going to be a bubble and there's going to be a burst and all of this. 
when the reality is the numbers that they're using to determine it are skewed. Okay. Yeah, I have experience with um, Americans running Canadian numbers, um, just with some people that I used to get my stats from and stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, like, not just a grain of salt. Like, pretty much, pretty much, you just can't rely on it. It's not. It doesn't look at like. It doesn't look at the culture of like what's actually happening. Like the, what's underneath those numbers. Like it doesn't break it up the way it should be broken up. I believe this is yeah. what I'm saying to you. Like I believe I believe that from my own experience with American numbers about Canadian real estate. Be very careful. Like it's easy to start scrolling through Facebook, Instagram, you know, well, not Instagram so much, but like Facebook um, and online and read articles before you like really read where those things are coming from. Well, and that was another point that came up. So because mm-hmm. of the way that the um, – the ad analytics work. If you Google anything, or even it seems now with smartphones, if you just talk about anything, you start seeing ads for those things Mm -hmm. in your feeds. I'm sure everybody's experienced that. Mm -hmm. The thing is, they don't distinguish necessarily geographically where you are. They just take a look at the most popular articles related to that. Mm -hmm. So you can have something, like for example, I saw recently, there was an article about uh, a 1% interest rate. Uh, for mortgages, but it was from a paper in the UK or or a website in the UK, Mm -hmm. but it was showing up in my feed because I look at things related to mortgages. And so it showed up in my feed, even though it's not at all relevant to where I am geographically. Mm -hmm. And I think this happens to people where they just see that and they're like, well, it's in my feed, so it must be relevant to me or where I am. And it's not necessarily. So you do have to be cautious of that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that, that he mentioned we are in the longest period of time we've ever had with continual economic growth without any type of recession. I see. That's where, that's where I think the general public, like that's basic, that's a basic, like I noticed this. Like that's right. where, that's where so we've had continuous growth for longer than any other period of time mm-hmm. without some form of recession. Mm-hmm. The reason why we're not at the risk of a recession right now, according to him, and this makes a lot of sense, is because typically now with the exception of November, we just had a huge amount of job loss. But, um, usually what they look at is when you've had economic growth, it means that joblessness is at a low rate. Well, when joblessness is at a low rate, it means there's more competition for the workers. And when there's more competition for the workers, people are more likely to jump jobs for the sake of getting a pay increase. Right. Uh, things like that. Okay. That's not happening right now. And the reason that's not happening is because the largest growing sector in employment right now is 55 and up. And people who are 55 and up are happy where they are, and they're of the mindset of you don't rock the boat, you just take what you get, and then you work for your employer. Yeah, that's right? definitely that mindset. It's that, yeah. it's that generation that yeah. you have one or two jobs your entire life or what have you. Yeah. And, and so, so that's not happening because the lar- largest growing sector of employment is 55 and up, where they're just yeah. – here to work and offset their their incoming pension or soon to come pension or what have mm-hmm. you, and so it's not like they're working to pay off a mortgage. Their mortgage is paid off. Yes. Right. Things like that. So or it's it. so it's yeah. Or so it's those it's those scenarios mm-hmm. where okay, traditionally this is what would happen, but we're not in a traditional environment anymore. No. No, we're definitely so, not. So it was really, it was really quite interesting. Really, it is, really, really quite interesting. It is quite interesting, actually. Um, what I find interesting about that um, is something that we that um, we don't talk about actually very often. And it's jog, jogging my thoughts here about things we may want to kind of touch on maybe later on down the road. Uh, is mm-hmm. that you know I'm happy where I am. Uh, no reason to move. You know, uh, demographic. Hi, Caroline. Uh, um, but, you know, the, the, that's something to talk about because we do talk a lot about, like, you know, other demographics. So it might be interesting to talk about, you know, where because where, because I have done uh, most of the time in that scenario, it's usually divorce or needing to mm-hmm. move for one reason or another um, for that demographic. Um, but really the motivation to move when I talk to, when I run into 55 plus or 50 around there kind of, there's really no, like that is not a market of people that it, I ever have that conversation of, Oh, what are my options for real estate? It's always more like 
Definitely. you know, everything below for different various reasons. You know, what can I get for my house? It, could we upgrade? Could we downgrade and do and live and live more, you know, jet set -y, you know, like that, that demographic tends to kind of just, well, we'll just stick it out because why wouldn't we? So here was one of the, you know? one of the things that I thought was very telling for both our industries. Mm -hmm. um, Cause they're connected. They are very connected and especially in this way. Renting is going to become the norm. Mm -hmm. So the the sector of people who rent into their mid thirties mm -hmm. and it's I pay rent and I'm okay with that. It's mm -hmm. you know it's not it's not like oh you don't own your home yet you don't own a home yet. Mm -hmm. People are going to be comfortable renting a lot later in life. Yeah. And and um, we're starting to see it already. Mm -hmm. But because of this, the rental market is going to explode. So. All of these new builds that we see, we're going to see a lot more people um, recognizing this and saying, okay, I'm going to buy a property now that eventually I might feel comfortable downsizing into and rent it out to let somebody else pay down the mortgage of that. And then when I sell my home, I have my property already set up that's mortgage free that somebody else paid for. Let me tell you a little secret. I've done that a few times this year. <laughs> right? So so there's times. there's the rental because it's going to be it's going to become people in their 30s are going to be like I rent. Mm -hmm. I've already thought about it. Like and I've already thought about it. And, and the other sector is the the group that you talked about. You get people who are going through separation or divorce in their late 50s mm -hmm. and they're going to say, "Well, why would I buy now and take on a 25-year mortgage?" Yep. Yeah. A, if I can even qualify for it, because I'm going to be retiring in, a, in like five, six years. Why not just rent? Why not sell the house, split it, you know, and, and take that money and, and rent? Your, but, and then a lot of times when you talk about this, he's like, when realtors hear this, they're like, no, 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 no. We want people to buy. We want people to buy. Well, it's okay if they're right, because other people have to buy those properties for them to rent. So that's true. Yeah. Yeah. It does not hurt the real estate market at all. No, it really doesn't. No, it really doesn't because somebody – there's always people that want to – and, and it comes out of the woodwork. There's people that, you know, didn't think they'd ever be landlords, and all of a sudden they're like, you know what? I think I'm, just, I think I'm in a good spot and pull money from my house and buy this place and rent it out. And there's well, always – and I'll tell you, I, renting places – I'm I'm showing I'm I'm helping a client out right now make connections because they live in Toronto, and I'm showing their place to some people this weekend. But so I have four people, like, and it's just like no problem, you know. But that's exactly it. The role of the realtor is evolving now, so that I, I know you've done this for a couple of years. But if you have clients who buy investment properties, part of the service you offer is I'll find you a tenant. I'll help you find a tenant. Yep. Yeah, depending right. on the degree of what how they much they want me to be involved. Sometimes I just do like make connections, show it, and then I filter them off to them all the way down to like I'll get you attended, sign it up. Yeah, call so it a day, you know, it's a service I offer. You know, it's becoming less and less um, the risks of of being a landlord or the time commitment to being a landlord is drastically becoming not what it was right and i see how that doesn't necessarily how it doesn't like they're not really thinking about that in the stats that somebody has to buy that property to rent it out anyway there's always somebody buying the property and to to, to rent it out it's always been popular in my family mm -hmm. to to rent like we don't have a lot of homeowners in my family um, my grandpa my nana and papa he was in the army they lived everywhere and they only ever rented um they just always rented and they were superintendents and things like that. Some people choose the lifestyle, like why would we commit kind of thing. Um, but there is always somebody has to buy it in order to, to rent it out. And I think that we're, I think I'm, I think what I'm seeing in the market is I'm seeing people who never, and what you, what you said is that, uh, you know what, we're not ready to move to Guelph. We're not ready to move to Fergus or we're not ready to do that yet. But, for, we'd like to buy the property if it's the right property and then fix it up, rent it out, and then we'll move there in like our in 10 years. Right. You know, like and because they still want to live in the city. They still wanna they still wanna do those things, you know, like, but they want to get in, in the Guelph Market Fergus area um before, you know, they feel like they get, you know, priced out, which is a reality. It's something that I want to talk about too about this time of year. Um so but we are seeing a lot more people like I'm even considering it. I'm even considering my first investment property, 2020. It's happening. Yay. Hey, Landlord Gino. Sandy. Um, and part of this is also, I mean, obviously, we went through the whole 
Airbnb phase where a lot of people are buying them up to I use in that. I still think Airbnb is a killer idea. You know, a lot of people buying properties to use in that sense. I would do um, it. So there's a ton of things there. And because of that, I, th I think people more and more are going to realize that real estate needs to be a part of their retirement plan, their retirement portfolio. I, 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 I'm going to tell you, it's just like real estate, just like taxes and death. It's all part of your life. You're either renting from someone or you're owning and paying and paying into a mortgage or you're or or you're a combination of those and investing in yourself by by renting it to somebody else. No matter what, even if you even if you're like, "Oh, I'm not getting involved in the real estate market." If you're renting from someone, you're part of it. If you're mm -hmm. living in your parents' basement, paying them rent, you are a part of the real estate market. You it, you cannot get away from it. it. It's part of your life. So it's already part of your retirement plan. It really Whether is. you actively make it part of your retirement plan or not, it's already a part of your retirement plan. Right. Exactly. So and it's, it's one might, of those like, things where... For me, I always tell people, you might as well be master of it. You know, you might as well be master of it. And there's so many things that people... Uh, and, and I'm going to say this. Mm -hmm. If at all you, you are thinking this is something you want to do, and I'm not talking about next year, or I'm not talking about the year after, I'm talking <coughs> if at all all you think this is something you want to do mm -hmm. it needs to be part of your plan now because mm -hmm. there are so many things from a number side from a mortgage side from a taxation side and you you will want to have a good accountant somebody who understands the taxes because things like you mortgage rate your interest rate uh, things like any expenses involved in that property all of those things are subject to potentially being written off mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of people who recognize this and say well wait a second that means it's better to take equity out of my investment property and pay down my home mortgage because even though that's got a higher interest rate, I can write that off at the end of the year. Right. right? So there's all these things that mm -hmm. that the nuances that if you understand it, you can kind of suddenly say, oh, okay, well, how much money do I need for a down payment? And, and here, you know, it's yes, if it's your second property, if it's an investment property, you need that 20% down. Mm -hmm. Or you buy a property with 5% down and rent out the property that you were living in. Yep. Suddenly that's 15% you didn't have to save up, mm -hmm. right? So there's all of these things, and this is why it needs to be part of your plan now. Because yep. um, even if you're thinking this is something like you're buying your first home, okay, the next thing we should talk about is are you ever planning on owning investment properties? Because if so, that should be part of your mortgage strategy starting now when we map it out going forward. And I am... Uh, so when I did my when I got my mortgage, I did not think I was going to be landlording at any point in time. You know, you and I talked about a few options, but um, mortgage investing is another one as well. So yeah. if you have the money, lending mortgage lending is a big market as well. Less issues with tenants and things like that. Um, there's so many options. Like and but no, but at the end, like the sooner you can think about that sort of thing, the better. Um, Real estate is part of your retirement plan. It, real estate is part of your everyday life, whether you're renting in a building, if you're, you know, like I said, all the way down to like, all the renting way. It, living in your parents' basement, renting a room from them, you know, like you're, it's part of it. Like, don't ignore it. Well, if be proactive, if you think speak you're going to be a mortgage professional, thank you. You're welcome. A Jedi. If you think that you're going to yeah, sell your sorry. property and take that money and live off that money, Mm -hmm. then real estate's part of your retirement plan, right? Like if you think about it, it, it is. Whether you realize it or not, it is. So being aware of how it is so you can position yourself in the appropriate way, That's right. take, advantages, uh, take advantage of different market trends as they happen. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to put you in the best position to succeed. And I and, and I and I and I do want to with, with this. I do want to like Guelph is specifically as a bubble as its own um, entity. I get a lot of people that say, "Oh, you know, I'll never be able to own in Guelph." On the you can, uh, you absolutely can. We just need to manage your expectations. And also, maybe it's not Guelph, but you have to. You need to get people on your side that are willing and able to look for the things that fit your specific uh, needs. You know, like you, you can. I thought I could never buy in Guelph, and here we are. You know, like yep. it's. I was at that point five years ago. Sandy was definitely like, I'm never going to own a home in Guelph. 
you know? again, it's and like you're talking about buying an investment property. Like, come on now. It's expectations. The the, the difference between my expectations. The difference between where you are and where you want to, and, and you can own if you adjust your expectations accordingly. Yeah. And I'm not saying forever. Not forever. Right? No, it's just not forever. Okay, if what you want is this detached home with a yard and all of that, it's probably not gonna be your first home. But use your first home to get to it. Right. Right? So if if there's only two of you, a one bedroom, one bathroom is sufficient. It's sufficient. Start there. Start there. Build build equity in that. And then use that to get to the next property. And then use that to get to the next property. Well, yeah, it's, and, it's not like you because you otherwise you're chasing inflation. Uh, yeah, well, that's just it, right? Is that like it's pay to play? I guess. Like I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't want it, I don't want it to be harsh. But it, it's it, yeah, the housing housing market. The sooner you get in and just manage your expectations. This is my instead of the first thing I ask of a first time home buyer. What what how long would you like to be in this house that you just described to me? Oh, we'd like to be in it seven to 10 years. Okay. So <laughs> that's you, you, what you're looking for. doesn't fit your budget. How about we shorten that timeline and maybe say, let's say for the next three to four or five years, you're here, you know, semi-detached um, condo or townhouse or something like that. Like, managing just managing the expectations and there's always someone that has to sell for some reason or another i have seen miracles happen you know like of places where i felt like i actually walked away feeling bad like and we stole it in a way you know like a few times i would say regularly over my years of real estate it's happened the the reality is so here's the thing here's the thing i had to, had to there, get in there there it is um when you're dealing with purchasing and, and you're looking at mortgage and what you can afford and all of these things, oftentimes, you know, I, I just said it's their expectation that keeps them from, from getting to where they want to go. Mm -hmm. I don't even think it's their expectation. I think it's what they believe other people's expectations of them are. So it's what the Could parents be. would say. Oh, right. It's what their friends oh, would say. Yeah, it's I feel it's, parents it's, it's what did what did my sister and brother-in-law just buy yeah. or you know and so it's you know inside they might be like you know we'd be okay with this just because we're owning but it's not as nice as what so-and-so just got well you're not them yeah. you know you're not it's not a competition the so, comp you know it's one of those things where just do, you do you and yeah. and worry about that and you'll be better off yeah it's right? a it's an investment you know like and i don't know i i just I just think that, you know, and so like to your point about to go way back about what this guy was saying about the um, market trends and mm -hmm. about uh, the, 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 the being um, an issue with the bubble and things like that. So um, when we run the numbers here at uh, Remix Real Estate Center, um, I love it here. Just no, I'm not. I'm, I just use my voice because. That's the way it is. Um, anyways, but when we when they send out our numbers and and you know Rebecca and I go back and look at the numbers, like like I don't know, I'll put this in front of you, Jamie, and maybe I'll share it on my Facebook and my Instagram. But when we look at places like Kitchener Waterloo, um, it just in November, for instance, we're looking in the five hundreds, high fives, Cambridge low fives. This is for the median. This is for the average sale price in Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge. Okay, this are average sale prices. Um, that you know we're still looking in the fives here, basically well, anywhere from low fives to high fives. Niagara. Th this is what I love because when I see these things, everybody you know everybody has a perception. It's like, oh, you know, I'm not gonna I'm gonna go buy in KW because it's cheaper than Guelph. Not anymore. Not really. Not anymore. Okay, then I'm going to go to Cambridge because it's less expensive. Anymore. Yeah, not by much. Not by much. Not by much. Mount Forest? Mount Forest? You know, it's um, like... The more you... It just, it's like, oh, I, I always tell people, well, what about Brantford? Yeah, you haven't seen what's happening in Brantford cool. lately then. Mass exodus. <laughs> uh, but if you... Th this along the highway, if it, this is the 401, you want to go no. You want to go north. Like, go this way. This but way, not this way. It's the, just getting more and more this way as you go this way. Once the train connects it, guys. But going north, even going north is not 
feasible for a lot of people now because depending on where they like you get a lot of people <coughs> who are commuting here to the city right and stuff like that Toronto's and so, making Toronto a lot of Toronto companies like people that I helped buy buy houses for like three four years ago a lot of their jobs have turned more remote so they don't have to go into the city as much anymore so so that's the city. that's the next trip so yeah um but if we look at these numbers like Hamilton is still 535 I love Hamilton shout out to the hammer I love you can we skip uh, Oakville because that's okay? So no, <laughs> that'll give that'll so give gonna, palpitations to we're people. We're gonna here. get we're gonna come back to it. So if you so my experience is when people so there's Brampton. So when people are when people are talking about Guelph numbers and being like, oh, we're in a bubble, like that's it, we've topped out. You know, there's no way house prices could get more than that. Well, let's talk about Mississauga as like high eights for the average sale price. Brampton is mid mid, mid sevens. sevens. Orangeville, what, Orangeville was actually lower as five seventy five. Which but still, was it's, interesting. it's uh, Orangeville on par with Guelph. Nobody would have thought Orangeville right? was on par with right? Guelph. Right, and then, but then if we look at Holton, Holton, Holton Hills is five sixty five, seven sixty five. It's worth the drive to Acton. It is uh, Acton. <laughs> I do like Acton. Shout out, shout out to Acton. Um, but Milton is still eight hundred thousand. So and Toronto, 20, minute, twenty minutes up the four. Toronto is nine hundred thousand average sale price. Oakville is a million one point zero six. So. This is what I, this is what I see is I see people coming from Toronto, not necessarily Oakville. People don't really move from Oakville to Guelph. It's kind of like no, no. It's like Oakville is so nice. Have you ever been to Oakville? Have you ever been? I oh. have. Well, Jesus, I was asked to leave. <laughs> kindly, <laughs> kindly, kindly stopped by it's a nice officer. Sir, you're making a scene. No, it's like. <laughs> dress clean cut officer, and he offered you a nice lunch at a local. Yeah. You know, bed Can I breakfast. please escort you to the Oakville city limits? <laughs> <laughs> but Oakville is beautiful. Mm. Aesthetically, it is gorgeous. People don't leave Oakville unless they absolutely have to. You know, and and they definitely don't move to Guelph afterwards. And Guelph is beautiful too. But Guelph is potato, pota like it's potato potatoes. Like, why would you move from Oakville to Guelph? It doesn't make any sense unless it's a financial sense at this point. But here's but Oakville but, is so much. There's still so much demand for. I mean. They're redeveloping. Glen Abbey got sold. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like, yeah. yeah. So, and that's that was like the known thing for Oakville. It's like Glen Glen Abbey Golf Course. Got, 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 got sold. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the so anyway. So what I'm saying is, is that in my in my in my business, I notice I I move more and more people from to here for, to Guelph, Fergus, Alora from the GTA area. Their prices there are still. There's a. This is a two-parter. Their prices there are still absorbent. So even though Guelphites and people from here, and I still struggle with it, still think that the prices here are absorbent. They're not as absorbent as what's right up the road, and Guelph is still very desirable. So I don't. So two things here. Two things. One, it does not matter what you build in Guelph. One. I won't use this finger because this uh, one broke. Uh, uh. One. Uh, uh, uh. He was my favorite. Um, it does not matter what you build in Guelph. It will increase in value at the steady rate as long as those other cities, people are still saying, I can't afford to live there or I do not want to pay the, that amount to live. Right. I want more space, more things coming to Guelph, right? That, that, that it does not matter what you build. I don't care if you put a container home and in behind a factory in the ward. It may be a hundred thousand dollars now. It will be three hundred thousand dollars in a year and a half. That's not just, really, but yes. No, it probably will be because it'll be hipstery. It'll be hip. That's I'm true. sorry. I'm gonna, I'm it's... gonna. I've decided 2020 is when I start actually speaking my mind about things. I'm willing to be wrong here, guys. It's a dark place. It's a dark be place. Be prepared. So dark. Um, and, but we have tacos. Um, but we have, so, but the. <laughs> it's a dark place. But, but we, we have tacos. tacos. Um, but. It does not matter. I do not care what you have. It will always go up in high rates because of these numbers. Like it's still number, but then that's on the buying side. Okay. So no matter what that necessarily, that's might be what you're in competition with. Two is it factors into when we're selling your house. Like it matters. So if your buyer is coming, if I say, if I go into your house, I always feel like a psychic when I go in and I'm like, walk around and I'm like, all right, your buyer 
is from like because i know where your buyer's coming from that's my job i work in this business every single day i wake up i eat sleep breathe it every day drink it too um a lot her shreddies are house shaped yeah they are um but they uh i put it in my smoothie every morning um but they when we are putting a price on your house we need to factor in why would somebody move from the gta to what do they have? What what if somebody's buying your house here? Let's say it's a let's say you're um, you're in a three bedroom, twenty five hundred plus square foot home, you know, in Guelph. You know, like okay, what does somebody that has you know maybe a fifteen hundred square foot home with three bedrooms, maybe no pool, you know, in GTA and not not such a nice size lot they're going to be selling theirs to come and buy yours. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Why are they going to, like, why, why are they going to do that? Why are they doing that is one, what we have to figure out Two, we have to figure out um, what they're, they need a price motivation to come. How do we get their attention? Yeah. You can't say, Oh, they're going to be selling their houses for like a $900,000. They'll, they'll spend, they can spend the money on my house. That's no, not they're, how they're that works. They're selling their $900,000 house. To be better off, to be not better to waste off. the money. The motivation is to move somewhere quieter, uh, nicer space, less money. That never goes away. That does not go away anymore. That's the difference. That right there, this guy, is the difference. Not even an hour. <laughs> not even an hour. <laughs> that guy is the difference between 2016 and now. Right. Buyers is that they do not want to come and spend the extra money. They need to know the value. They're not, they're not just, Oh, just move to Guelph. It's fine. Here, take my money. I'm here now. You know, like it, they need to know what am I, what am I gaining moving here? I'm losing my friends and my neighbors and my community that I've built. Maybe my son has to change hockey teams and you know, like all these things, what am I gaining? And, and in order for me to commute back to Toronto and lose all those things and restart again, I've actually seen people come to my listings and be like, I, I just don't know what I'm gaining here. Like, and I've had that conversation repeatedly this year, working other people's open houses too. It's not just my pricing guys. So I want to, I want to share a little bit of putting these numbers into perspective for people. Uh, I have them. I'll that's, share them. That's what I do is I, I put numbers into perspective. So oftentimes I hear people say, and I actually hear older generations say it's my kids are never going to be able to buy. Right, like it's impossible. My kids are never going to get a mortgage. My, my kids are never going to be able to afford a house. I want to I want to share a little piece of information with you. If we were to take a look at what baby boomers got in 1977, Ooh. convert those numbers to 2017 dollars, mm -hmm. and and compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. Okay, the average household income for baby boomers was about seventy six thousand dollars a year. In, in 2017 dollars. The average household income for for millennials was about five thousand dollars a year more than that. Okay. Okay. So we're still comparing apples to apples. The average maximum mortgage affordable for, for baby boomers was about three hundred and fifty thousand. Average maximum mortgage affordable for millennials was over five hundred thousand. So it is not harder. In addition to that, if you took a look at the payments that baby boomers are making, it's the equivalent to about $2,500 a month in 2017 dollars, whereas millennials were averaging about $2,300 a month. Wait, you mean they had a $500,000 mortgage and were making lower mortgage payments? Interest yes, because we had double-digit interest rates, yeah. and you had to save up to 20% as a down payment. Those are things that don't have to happen now. That's so right. it is not more difficult to no, get into the housing market. Difficult. It's actually much easier. All of these measures that are being put in place by our government, by by um, uh, the Bank of Canada with mm -hmm. the benchmark qualifying rate, all of these measures that are being put into place to make things more challenging is because it was way too easy. And we got into a situation where people were getting more house than they could reasonably afford mm -hmm when interest rates were going up. Okay. So it's not a situation where it's difficult to get into the housing market or it's tougher for people to get into the housing market now. It was much tougher for our parents so much to buy a house. 
Yeah. But they knew that, okay, you know, like my dad was saying, you know, when we were going to get a house, we gave up our car. We gave up our car and took the bus so we could save for our down payment. We gave up things. Right. So it's that's the difference is they understood the process that it was okay. Well, if we want to do this, these are the things we have to do. Yes. Yep. Yeah. No. And that's and that's just it. Right. So and that's really great that you put that in perspective there because same, same, you know, like and I get that there's a difference of like availability and jobs and stuff like we could go on about like, oh, one more, one more. Yes. One more quick thing. When I talked about the average property value, yeah. right, the maximum mortgage value. So in for baby boomers, it was three hundred and fifty thousand. If you were to look at twenty seventeen dollars, that actually got somebody a two thousand square foot detached home mm. in Toronto. Now five hundred thousand dollars gets you a six hundred and fifty square foot condo. Okay. So it's not that you can't own. It's that you have to realize what you can reasonably afford. It's not It's not that the ability to afford property got mm-hmm. tougher. It's that the properties became more in demand. Yes. Yeah. Right? It wasn't. It, so whenever somebody says, you know, oh, it's tougher to get a mortgage. No, it's not tougher to get a mortgage. You just have to recognize what that mortgage now equals in real estate. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like really it's a perspective thing. There are a lot of things there are a lot of things that uh uh we have the luxury of now. Um <laughs> uh, women can buy houses on their own. Um <laughs> sorry, know, I shouldn't have read that. No. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, no, we're just uh it's fine. Um so like there's a there's a lot of different luxuries that we have, like being able to work from home. Things like that. Cost of living is more. We're not going to ignore that. Um, How can you? Uh, no, you definitely can't. <laughs> Expectations, things like that. Um, but, you know, like, it, it's a matter of, like, you know, stop giving yourself the label of I'll never be able to and how do I form a team of people that are willing to talk to me about getting me there? This isn't a, like you were saying, like you were saying, like we we gave up our car, we stopped going for takeout food, like like we're these these became real goals and real motivations. And I will say, at that time, like people like my family chose to rent, just like they are now. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a new thing necessarily, you know. Yeah, it's going to be on the increase, I think, because of. You know, people, you know, I, I I think the difference between now and then is social media and and the ability of, pe- of people to get false information or propagandized kind of information where it's like bidding wars. It started in like 2016, mm. bidding wars and like using heavy combats and like battling it out for a house. And then this house was listed for this and it sold for this. And a lot of realtors were actually, you know, feeding that information to the media. That's actually private information, you know, like that belongs to the seller and belongs to the buyer, you know, like this is really got to filter through what you're, what you're reading, what you're learning and forming a team of people around you that support your ideas and help manage your expectations. There are a lot of government. There's a lot of things that a lot of people don't know about in ways that like help you get a deposit. Like even with the new government thing that I'm still weary about, but there's other ones too. There's other services and things that help you get a down payment. There's, lots of different ways to get started. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, speaking with someone and, and, and getting people behind, getting, getting people you trust behind you to rally behind you and willing to do meet 50, 50. And I feel like I'm talking to my teenager here, but like 50, 50, like we'll meet you. I, people will come halfway, you know? So there, there has always been a balance between lifestyle and ownership. Okay, so ownership comes. At, there are so few people who can have everything they want in a lifestyle and everything they want in a home as well. Right. There has to be a trade off at some point. Yeah. Right? And unless you're going to work nonstop or 
be in such a specialized field or what have you. Mm -hmm. There is, and and then that's part of lifestyle. That's part of lifestyle. Right? So there's always a trade-off. Are you going to, you know, if you want this kind of a property, are you going to do the things that are required or give up the things you'll have to give up in order to make it a reality? If not, if you'd rather have the lifestyle and not give those things up, then you, you, like you can't have the, there's no it's having almost, both not yeah unless it's very rare them. to be able to have both right um you talked about the you briefly touched on the the CMHC um shared equity mortgage mm. interesting thing is not all lenders are actually doing it oh okay. so some lenders some lenders are saying I'm with those we're lenders. we're not we're not going to uh, uh do the shared equity mortgage program mm-hmm. um so there are a few lenders that I've that I found out are not doing it. I personally have not had a single client um, opt for it yet. Okay. I haven't so, had anybody want to take it on. No. I've had people ask me about it, set them your way, or I've had sent them other ways or whatever. Whatever has to happen, I haven't yet to have somebody say, "Yeah, mm-hmm. that's an option for me." Mm-hmm. I'm actually so okay with it's, that. It's pretty. It's pretty. Uh, yeah, and I think part of it was it came out right when an election was happening. I mean, we just actually got through the first confidence vote with mm-hmm. the minority government. So um, I think people are a little apprehensive about the longevity of it. Mm-hmm. And and that makes sense. I, 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 from the hop, I've been nervous about the longevity of that. I don't, what happens? What happens if that program stops and then 20 years? Everybody down the road, has to pay us back now. Right? Like, I don't know, man. I don't like it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we've I think we've touched on a lot of what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? Twenty nineteen has been for buyers. Do you feel like it's been so? I can I can. Uh, well, we're gonna do buyers and sellers. So I can tell you, twenty nineteen has been my busiest year. You say, um, and you know we talked. Back in 2017, we actually said, you know, anybody who said they were successful in 2016, take it with a grain of salt. Then all the measures came into place to make things less Wild Mm West-like. And, and, you know, how'd you do in 2017? And then how did you do in 2018 when it got even more strict? Mm -hmm. And then how are you doing now? Yeah. Um, So it was was, uh, my personally, my busiest year. Mm Mm-hmm. I actually saw a shift of people qualifying more on the A side, um, not necessarily having to go to the B side. And and part of this is A lenders were adjusting their expectations a little bit. Um, okay. And so it made it it made for situations where people with lower credit scores than what you used to be able to get approved on the A side for or get insured with, like an insured mortgage with. We're actually qualifying, mm-hmm. um, and that's made things pretty interesting and and pretty awesome for people. Mm-hmm. The biggest, uh, I guess, I'll I'll save the 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 rest of that to what we see happening next year. But I will say that from a buyer's perspective, people came in with a better understanding. Mm-hmm. I think the one maybe area of opportunity still when it comes to expectations for people is understanding um, what a lender is going to ask. Okay. It's not an adversarial process. These people want to give you their money. They want to give you a mortgage because that's the only way they make money. They make, they money make money, on, money. The, on the interest rate. Yeah. So it's not a situation where they're like, okay, prove yourself to us. No, people want your money. They're people just saying, you okay, this is what you told us in the application. Mm-hmm. Now give us the documents to verify. You know those like and, you know those email, you know those like letters you get in the mail with like false credit cards in them. You're like, oh my god, this is it. Mm-hmm. You know, like I got a credit card. Say like the, the credit card people want you to call them so they can get your interest. Lenders want to give yeah. It to you. So lenders want to give you mortgages because, uh, it, it, but they want to be smart about it because it's in both your interest and their interest to make sure they're doing their due diligence. Because then you're not going to get a mortgage that you can't handle, mm-hmm. and they're not going to take on a. a, a bad mortgage. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's in everybody's best interest that it's a successful thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but with the, I, I want you to think about this. If you were to lend somebody half a million dollars, 
Oh, no, so wait. I'm pretty sure you're going to want to see... We say half a million dollars. It's a lot of money. Well, when I say, but it's true. When I say, you saw the house for 20 minutes, it's $500,000. They're taking offers tonight. Would you like to put an offer? Yeah. It doesn't feel as heavy. No. But when you're, when you're, when, if somebody was coming to you and asking for that money, and you said, okay, well, what's your ability to pay me back? And they say, well, here's a letter from my employer. Are you going to call their employer and make sure they work there? Yeah. Right. So lenders have started doing these things, whereas in the past they just took a pay stub and a job letter and said, okay, that's it. Right. No, now they want to see a job letter, a pay stub. They're going to call and do a verbal confirmation, and they may want to see your two-year tax return history just to say, okay, is this a recent job that you just got, or do you have a history of this? You know, so they're they're being smart about it because they have to be. Well, and history shows. Exactly. Right? So I think that's the one area of expectation you can have. And so that's why whenever I get an introductory email, like if you send me, hey, so-and-so, meet Jamie in an email and you connect us, one of the first things I send is a, a documents list. This is what you can expect to have to provide to any lender. And um, that's the one area where I think people still – are maybe a little surprised by how much documentation is involved. So much documentation. Right? And then and you're and always sometimes, running around scrambling to get something. Well, and always. sometimes they're like, well, how come my bank might not ask for this? Well, because your bank has permission to basically look at all your financials that That's you right. have with them at any yeah. given point in time. So <laughs> Yeah, your bank has like carte blanche to your access to your everything. Yeah, I don't think people realize that when they sign the agreements for accounts Google. and stuff like that, it's like, okay, you're letting them see everything. Um, yeah, so that, that's about, that's, that's about that. So, yeah, well, I think that I, for me, I felt like 2019 was tipping and I think we were bang on with our January. If we go back and look at our January thing, I, I really feel like we were bang on with the buyer market. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel like that will echo into, uh, 2019, sorry, to 2020. I feel like that we're going to, um, see, uh, buyers take the reins. I, uh, there, and it comes from this. It comes from that. What am I spending my money on? Uh, I, it, well, it comes from a couple of things. It comes from, I'm not getting in a bidding war. I'm not getting in, you know, those kinds of things, situations. Um, it comes from people being like putting their foot down about that. And you are, you are the market. Buyers are the market. I did not see a single situation this year, uh, or last year for that matter, but um, where a lender said, no, the house is not worth what they're paying for. Yeah, that's hallelujah. I'm not a religious person, but hallelujah, because that was happening. That was happening a lot. in 2017. Um, and I'm really glad that's not part of our future here. But we're getting buyers that are being savvy. We're getting realtors that are getting smarter about it. There were realtors that just were letting their people spend the money on houses and they were not appraising out and people were getting caught with their pants down and it's not, not, not you're not taking care of your client's financial health when you do those things. Um, so the I think that we're I think that 2019 we saw the rise of the buyer market or at least the rumblings and the beginning of it and I saw it like I would say that I was maybe about 65 percent buyer control heavy I would say more than 50 mm. like where buyers had had the control of yes or no and that's with my listings or with my buyers specifically um we're moving away from the presenting of the offers. So it's hard to sit and sway. I've got a system for it now. So it's hard to know exactly if multiple offers like are being swayed by dollars or people or hmm. brokerages. I don't know. But so I like to sit in front of people and have a conversation. Um, we'll see. We'll see how 2020 goes. But I think hmm. that I personally think that 2020 we're going to see a whole new revolutionized expectation of buyer. I think sellers, I think it'll be seller beware in 2020. That's how I feel about it. I'm going to be brassy about it, guys. Here it comes. 2020, seller beware. So, 20 and, and that's, and now we're talking, sorry, we're talking about Guelph, Kitchener, Cambridge, Waterloo, Fergus, Alora. Like we're, this is mm -hmm. the bubble that I mostly work in. That, that we're going to say, I'm going to say seller beware. So 2020. Don't not sell. Selling you can. Just seller beware. Be on point. Be on point and meet expectations. 
2020 on a mortgage stand uh, from a mortgage standpoint. Here's a couple things you're gonna see. Um, I suspect we went the entire year without the Bank of Canada actually doing anything with the overnight lending rate. Oh yeah, no, it's so, year. yeah, it's three times for sure, right? How many times is that? Like it's a whole year. Eight, eight announcements. Eight announcements. Okay. Nothing changed. So I so, I noticed the last I I noticed the last three times. Yeah. So but, nothing changed. Yeah. Um, and, so, and Earth did not get blown up by the Death Star. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, both a of them are non-news. A little bit facetious on my <laughs> Both part. of them are non-news. Um, so, uh, so, but still, is that does that make you nervous? No, not at all. Actually, it it, it shows me a couple of. It gives me mm -hmm. confidence okay. because good. So good. For, glad as a someone quick, confident. A, a quick little lesson: uh, fixed rate mortgages are tied to our bond market. So as our bond market goes up and down, so do the fixed rate mortgages. Okay. okay. So if we have a weaker bond market, you get lower interest rates on fixed rate. Variable rate are tied to the Bank of Canada's overnight lending rate. So are things such as lines of credit, credit card, well, credit cards, not really, but lines of credit, uh, things like that, loans. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all tied to that. So that's more based on the strength of the economy, not based on the bond market. Okay. okay? Uh, weaker economy means lower interest rates in that situation. Mm -hmm. So because we had a strong economy, nothing was done. Mm -hmm. Typically they would raise it, but they didn't because they recognized, well, yes, we have a strong economy, but it's a strong economy that's, that's the, the take back isn't happening. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're like, okay, so let's, let's leave. There's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on geopolitically. There's a lot going on, mm -hmm. you know, that we'll see how it goes. So, Here's what we can expect next year. I suspect we might actually see a rate drop, Ooh. although it may not happen. And the reason for that is because the current okay. governor of the Bank of Canada has announced he's not going to go for a second term, which means as of July, we're getting a new governor of the Bank of Canada. Ooh. And we are not 100% certain who that's going to be. But if you knew you were going to leave a position in six months' time, chances are you're not going to make any decisions where the ripple effects are going to fall on your successor. Yeah. So you you may see a rate drop, and if you do, or if you see any movement with the rate, that's a pretty good indication that the second in command is going to be taking over. The assistant governor is going to end up taking he's over. Just it's going up for a lot of smoke breaks. Probably. I don't. I don't know if it's a little smokes, but maybe. Uh, so <laughs> reaching back to my roots. He's actually in a corridor with Justin Trudeau, making fun of Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> God, I hope so. <laughs> So I loved. I don't know about you, but I loved every minute of that. I loved every minute of the that. The fact that Joe Biden immediately used it as a political ad against Trump was hilarious. Um, Biden's my boy. Okay, off off topic. So the second, so we may see a little bit of a rate drop, but mm. chances are you're going to see things stay pretty similar, pretty close to where they are right now through to the summer, until that succession so, happens. So. Does that normally when they switch over? Does it, is there usually a hike of some kind? Is it usually like I'm coming? Depends here. who comes in. It depends. So in the case of the the current governor, mm -hmm. he was not the second in command. Usually that's how it works. Is there's a successor, but occasionally it's not. Occasionally they'll take somebody else completely, um, and then you could see if they go with somebody else completely, you can you could see a complete shift. I don't know that you'll see that because we. If at that point in time we're still with a liberal minority government, chances are they'll want to keep somebody in place who is, is like-minded. Oh, that's what. So, um, um, so I don't think we're going to see much happen at least before the summer. Okay. All right. So that gives you confidence from a buyer standpoint that you're not going to get any surprises. Okay. That makes Next me feel thing, much more confident about this. You spring. are going to see I'm where you're going to see regulations really come down hard in the mortgage industry is actually on the private lending side. So right now, private lending doesn't have near the regulations that um, that that you have from the A or B side. Okay. And so you're going to see these private lenders who are going in there and doing what primarily equity-based lending with high fees, high rates, yeah. interest only, things like this. Situations that generally uh, are stopgap solutions and can sometimes be challenging for people to get out of. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to make sure that when you have clients, and I, I have done private mortgages for clients, and I always preface it by saying, okay, I want to make sure this is a stopgap solution and we have a succession plan in place for you. Mm -hmm. And second, I want you to make sure you understand the risks involved in this, um, which you should with any any mortgage. But um, you're going to see a lot more 
clamp down on the private mortgage side. What that's going to do is it's going to cause um, right now the B side, what we call the B side. So you have your A lenders, which are, you know, your, your national lenders, your banks, your credit unions, things like that. And then you have your alternate lenders, the B side, which they do higher debt ratios, people with more bruised credit, um, things like that. Ooh. They took a bit of a beating this year because uh, the A side started making more things happen mm -hmm. and the private lenders were quick to swoop in and say, I'll make this happen for you. And so because of that, the B side kind of took a bit of a, a bit of a beating this year. And so they're going to want to reestablish themselves in the marketplace as that stopgap solution. Mm -hmm. And it's a much better stopgap solution, right? Okay. So you're going to see uh, some really great things happen with people not having to result on in that. And especially with the clamping down. So um, the private lending side, mortgage brokers, what this means is there are brokers out there who really focus on the private side of things mm -hmm. because they get a lot of money for doing so. Yeah. Uh, because generally speaking, these are people who don't have an alternative. And so they can, you know, tend to charge a little bit more for it and things of that nature. Those people are going to find themselves having to reacclimate them, reacclimate with all the changes on the bank side. And what's going to happen, who knows. But it's going to be a very similar landscape to in 2016 in the real estate section where you had people who were able to come in, uh, list an open house on the Thursday, or list a uh, property on the Thursday, hold open houses that weekend, hold offers on the Tuesday, and get 50000 over asking price and think that they were being successful. Those people quickly found out that they were not being successful, and, and as things changed in 2018 and 2019, a lot of those people didn't survive. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're going to see a similar mindset when it comes to the mortgage industry. You're going to see you're going to see people be more informed, ask more questions, and want a partner, I believe, who is more focused on education and answers. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think people are starting to accept the fact we're in a different day and age. People felt like they needed to, if I didn't know something, it made me look bad. Yeah. Right? Now people are accepting, oh, if I don't know something, it's okay. I need to have an expert who does. And that's the mindset people are going to, mm -hmm. right? And they're accepting of that. But they're also asking a lot of questions. They're not just blindly trusting somebody. And right. that's the key difference. So so those are some exciting things that I'm looking forward to. Is a, is a, You're going to see more informed buyers or continuously informed I buyers. I love informed buyers. And um, people craving content, genuine content. Yep. Not – Recycled content. Yes. Um, and I think that it's going to be a, a – It's we, we kind of used this term earlier this year, and I think we're going to really see it next year. It's going to be the year of the savvy real estate investor. Yeah, I think so. Whether you're buying for a place to live or buying for a, a, an investment property, you're trading in real estate, you're getting a mortgage, you're refinancing. This is the other thing. It's going to be a great year for refinancing. Good. Any – who got a mortgage within the last year or two, if your mortgage person, if your mortgage Jedi or your mortgage partner did not reach out to you at some point throughout this year and talk about how, what was happening with the rates to you and say, hey, here's your penalty, but you could save this, or hey, here's your penalty, you'd save this, but it doesn't balance out. If they didn't do that, they did you a disservice. Okay. It's so good to know. you should be reaching out to them and saying, what the heck? Or, yeah. Feel free to visit mortgagejedi.ca or give me a show. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, and I, um, I, 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 and I, I think that you touched on that there about the savvy real estate investor. I want people to understand that if you're just buying your own home, that you're a real estate investor. Yes. It's whether or not you choose to be savvy or not. You know, like so. I have. I. I. I am going to be taking money out of my house this year and to use for some major landscaping work because water is an issue in my uh, backyard. Um, so we want to make sure we take care of that, but also for other reasons, you know, like that we may want to apply, you know, to our everyday mm -hmm. lives, you know, like, so, but it's not like, like you, when we make that decision, we need to be savvy about the choice of 
what are we doing? How does that change our long-term goals? Bam, bam, where are we putting that money? Bam, bam. Like, it, it, it's up to you. It's, when we say real estate investor, that's you. That's you. Like, yeah. it's, that's you. Like, whether you're, you decide if you're savvy or not. So I'll give so. you a, I'll give you a quick tidbit for people to, to kind of say, okay, this is what we mean by savvy. Okay? Yep. And I think you articulated it well. Let's say yeah. you have a $500 a month car payment and it's 0.99%. Okay. All right. It's $500 a month you're paying on that car payment. But if you were to consolidate that into your mortgage, well, wait a second, my mortgage is 2.89%. You know, mm -hmm. So why would I want to consolidate it in my mortgage? It's a higher interest rate. Yeah. But amortized over 25 years mm -hmm. or 30 years, that $500 a month payment becomes $150 a month. Now you have $350 a month. And if you take that extra $350 a month and put it as advanced payments on your mortgage, guess what? You're paying less in the long run. Yes. You're saving money saving by doing money. it. Yeah. Same $500, just thinking about how to reapply it so that it actually means you save money because now all of a sudden you're paying down that principal. Yes. So you're paying less on your mortgage in the long term, and if you combine what you're paying on your car and mortgage, you're paying even less. Even less. Or you invest that three hundred and fifty dollars and let it accrue at four, six, eight, ten percent if you have somebody who's amazing, and suddenly you're making money. Yeah. Yep. There's lots of different ways, guys. But um, I just I I think twenty twenty we're gonna see some interesting things. There is a lot of and we can talk about this real quick because I know we're kind of running out of time. New build options in uh, southern Ontario. Um, we're going through it right now with some clients that have kind of um, pretty much can get what they want. Kind of just matter of what they like. Um, and as we're kind of doing some digging and we're looking around for these people and and deciding where they may want to land if this is an option for them. Um, there is so many options for new build construction. Um, it, but <laughs> so new build, new build construction is a little tough because it's a different down payment, um, structure, right? It's a different builder to builder. It can be a different down. It payment can be structure. different from builder to builder and it can be yes. tiered. Yes. And there's all kinds of things that factor into there's it. There's so many things that factor. Like they could say, oh, South Guelph. 650 base you know but really they need a million dollars by the end of the day like but it's it, it, there's so many options and things um looking at that as an option as well beautiful thing about new build is that before we used to tell people the yeah, like by the time they crack the ground you're looking at your you could be up you know, by the time, you know, they crack the ground, they're moving on to the next phase. You're, you, by the time they're selling the same house in the next phase, you're up 50 grand. Mm -hmm. I, I think in 2000 and 2020, we're not going to see that because necessarily like not that much of a gap. And, and, and because there's, there's so much new build, there's so many options now. Like it's just like, now it's like six and one or half a dozen and another, like it's, it's I think same, new, I same, think same, new build. same, 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 same. And then reselling them five years from now, everybody's going to be reselling. You know, yeah, five years from, from now. the original phase. Is yeah, gonna it's going to be reselling. So then here you have a cookie cutter that, you know, I'm going to have to try and market next to the house next door. Please include your, um, please include your real estate professional. This is my plea in your purchase of your new build home before like maybe like five six years ago ten years ago maybe that wasn't necessarily necessary i would say now it's necessary just from what i see because when i see these houses come up and then it's like oh well you know me and two other of the floor plans are up for sale now we're all in competition with each other for sale um we like what's the difference oh like we opted for the double garage or we opted for the you know, the waterfall, you know, countertop, or this is going to sound silly, or we opted for the loft, you know, uh, your real estate professional could be like, what's your goal for here? You I know, like, that, what's your goal? Okay, let, let's talk about finishes in order to resell this bad boy in five years. You know, that's... But I think talk. that talks, that, that lends itself to a conversation we had earlier. New builds are a great part, could be a great part of mm -hmm. your investment strategy. 
if you decide to use a new build as a rental property once you feel like it's no longer for you. If there's going to be three other build or three other similar units all up for sale at the same time and you're going to be in competition and maybe not be able to get the best dollar for it, well, then why not have somebody else pay down the mortgage? Because because you already have paid down part of the mortgage. It's going to be a cash flow positive investment at that point in time. So why not just keep it as an investment property, move to where you want to move to, yeah. and then keep that as part of your portfolio? Keep that as part of your portfolio. Like if that's your mindset, you know, when it comes to new builds, that might be the shift. That might be the shift. I, I really feel like there's just... The new build competition, like you need someone to decipher it all. And I feel like 2020, we're going to see a much different, a much different perspective. I think we're going to need to wrap up. Yeah, I think we're going to see a much different perspective on new builds. We'll actually, I'm going to try and get Rebecca in. We may have to like do it late January, um, but I'm going to get Rebecca in here to talk about new builds and what's on the horizon yeah, for next year. Because I really feel like 20. So my predictions for 2020 are. Buyer, buyer, um, uh, buyer market, like much more like seller beware, I guess is the term I'd like to use uh, of the buyers that are coming at you. Um, and then uh, new builds won't be all that they're cracked up to be as far as purchasing. And so my predictions are not much movement, very minimal, if any, in the Bank of Canada overnight lending rate. Okay. However, I want to be clear, that doesn't mean you're not going to see much movement in promotional rates for interest rates because we saw no movement at all this year, none whatsoever mm -hmm. in the overnight lending rate. Yet we saw rates shift uh, anywhere from December of last year to some point in the fall of this year by three quarters of a percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, so so you could still see promotional rate movement on the fixed side. I don't think you're going to see much happening on the variable side. Okay. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, you're going to see lenders becoming more competitive to, and, and you're going to see a lot more clamping down on the private side, but you're going to see A and B, like bank-style lenders, become more competitive uh, for your business somewhat, mm -hmm. um, which means they're either going to improve their product with things that they offer, such as, assumability, portability, things that are key. And if you don't know what those are, please visit mortgagegi.ca. Um, and uh, it's it's going to be a savvy, savvy buyer's market. So if you're thinking of getting into real estate, trading in real estate, investing in real estate, you need to do your homework. And that starts well before you actually go out looking at properties. Yep, it sure does. Okay, I, and I, I think you and I are on the same page when it comes to next year. Um, We'll see how it goes. I don't know. All right. Like, well, enjoy the holiday season, everyone. Yeah. I, hopefully, Sandy gets a nap. Oh, um, my God. Yeah, that'd be I great. I don't know if it's happening, but hopefully. That's all I want for Christmas. And thank you, everyone, for watching. We had a great viewership. Yeah, I love did. how many realtors and mortgage people tune in for this. That's great. It always makes me feel good to, to see that. Yeah. Uh, because it means inform, informed people are, are watching. And I wish they'd send us questions. That'd be great. Yeah, send, send us here. questions yeah, next like, time for when we, we do January. Uh, you can send it to us all week long, like or uh, monthly, and we'll just kind of rack them up. And well, we've done it before. We've been like, okay, I was talking with someone and you know brought mm -hmm. up this question, and we'll do it, no problem. Um, yeah, like totally. This and you can message us as we're here too. Mm -hmm. You feel free to leave comments, questions in the comments. We'll absolutely try to answer them for you to the best of our ability. Um, yeah. Anyways, happy holidays, guys. Yeah, happy holidays. And, we'll see you uh, in 2020, where we will all see clearly. In the future. We will all 20, see, we will see clearly oh, in Oh, man, you did it. You're the first one. I'm you not the first it. one. I actually saw somebody who posted, a realtor who actually posted, I foresee you buying a new house next year because I have 2020 vision. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love it. Okay, anyways, happy Good holidays, Good night, everyone. Guys. Good night. <laughs>